morning, everybody. We have a distracted crowd. That's always probably a good thing. Part of being part of a family is actually communication, right? I ought to tell my wife that. <laughs> so, this is, you know, we're, we're, we're missing a few bodies up here, you know, kind of a, a thinner crowd as that goes. It looks like we're missing some people today. Probably people taking advantage of the good weather before, well, should we have a blizzard in about a week or so? That seems about right. Um, <laughs> at least by Oktoberfest, right? So let's have everyone stand. We are going to worship the Lord today. We're going to start with House of the Lord, our newer song. Well, it is really great to be in the house of the Lord, and uh, in our Sunday school class, we've been going through a series in Philippians. It's about joy, and joy is that feeling that we have of excitedness when we expect something good to happen, and uh, a lot of good things are happening that we can be thankful for, but we want to welcome you to our service here at the Evangelical Free Church in Sydney today, and we're especially glad 
um, that you are here in the sanctuary. We no doubt have people in our library and back in our family center. And uh, you know, we can have people from all over the world on Facebook Live. So if you're on Facebook Live, thank you for getting up and making the effort to worship with us. You know, this morning, uh, as you've come in, there were several things that you could have picked up if you desired to pick up a calendar for the upcoming month of October. October is really here. I haven't counted out how many days left till Christmas time, but you know it's coming. Um, but Shauna has prepared a, a calendar of events for us out there, as well as our bulletin that we have every week. And so on the back of that bulletin are some dates that are very important to us, truly. Um, and many concerned Bible studies that take place several days a week right here in this building. We would invite you to consider that. And uh, for our guys, men, there's a couple of events that we want to talk about. This Thursday at noon, there will be a brown bag luncheon in our family center for anybody who wants to come, guys, to enjoy fellowship, to really relax and take a break from work and uh, just enjoy one another. And second, uh, in, the, in the back, you'll see that on October the 9th, Saturday, there will be a car care for our single ladies. And so, men, we want you to be involved in that so you can come and, and help evaluate those cars for our ladies, um, that they can have a safe vehicle to drive in, uh, in the coming winter time. That's coming. And at the same time, ladies, if you don't have someone at your home that that you can uh, rely upon uh, to keep track of your car, I want you to put October 9th on your calendar and come up here. And while the guys are looking at that, you can have some coffee and some donuts and uh, enjoy one another out there. So we encourage everybody to serve or otherwise take part in the events that go on here in our church every week. <clears throat> Well, as we've uh, begun to enter into our time of worship to think about that this is the house of praise, uh, I want to share something that I learned in my life about fear. My father was a Finnish carpenter for a long time, most of my life when I knew him, actually. And one summer, he was remodeling the district courtroom in this big building called the County Courthouse in Sheridan County in Rushville. It was during the summer months, and uh, my brother and I would go to work with him every day. Well, we couldn't help very much, so these little kids, these little boys, I was nine, my brother was seven, we found out that you could climb a ladder to get into the attic above the second story of that courthouse. And so we set out to explore that attic. Now, there wasn't any flooring in the attic, so we had to walk around on these rafters. And after about an hour or so, our dad poked his head uh, through that attic hole and asked us something like, well, what are you guys doing? It wasn't in those exact words. <laughs> we told him that we had been all over the attic, and we had found some really interesting things. And it was then that he got a real funny look on his face, and he asked us, how are you guys getting around up here? We said, oh, well, Dad, we're just we're walking on these rafters. And he said, that, that's how you're getting around? He was shocked. And he proceeded to inform us that if we had one misstep or a slip, there was nothing but a ceiling tile about that thick between us and the floor about 15 feet down. And when he told us that, Fear actually overtook my brother and I immediately, and we got down on our hands and knees, and we crawled over to the attic hole and went down the ladder, and we never went back up there again. <laughs> you know, life and experience will teach us that choices we've made in the past are really foolish, <laughs> and um, they're both they're poor and foolish. But perhaps the more we learn about life and our positions and learn about our awesome God, we realize that maybe we shouldn't walk around on the earth as cavalierly as we have in the past with high attitudes, but think about us as being vulnerable people and not superior to anyone. And so the wisdom books of the Bible that include 
Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, they consistently encourage us to fear the Lord, to respect our great God and keep his commandments because he sees everything that we do. And so this morning, Pastor Kyle will be in perhaps his final message in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And in that chapter, <clears throat> there's one sentence that I believe sums up the entire book of Ecclesiastes, and this is it. Fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. So this morning, we worship the Almighty God, who commands both our fear and respect, our reverence, and our praise. And we worship the one who is the King of Kings and really needs to be the King of our hearts. And someday in heaven, this same King is going to give us at least one crown, I believe, that we won't keep for ourselves. We'll give that back to him and crown him with many crowns. So let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we've come into your house with joy in our hearts that we can praise you, our wonderful and awesome God, who has our best interests at heart, who has deemed us to be righteous, not because of anything we've done, but because of everything that the Lord Jesus Christ did to pay the penalty for our sin. And we want to praise you this morning. We ask that you would accept our offering of our voices and, and our, our giving in whatever way it might be that we could honor you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Revelation 5 tells us, Worthy is the Lamb, Jesus who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Let's all stand and we are going to sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. In the Psalms, it tells us, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. My heart is set on keeping your decrees at the very end. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you.
Again in the Psalms from 64 and 34. Let the righteous rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart praise him. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Praise unbroken, praise unending, be yours, be yours forevermore. Praise untainted, praise unfading, be yours, be yours forevermore. Be yours.
Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much. You are so faithful to us, and you've created everything for us. You've given us everything that we need. You supply everything that we need. And Lord, uh, let us just give us that unbroken praise that, that we never cease calling out to you. We never cease giving you the respect and the love and the obedience that you ask for us. But Lord, I am so thankful that even when we make a mess of absolutely everything, that our faith in you and the blood that was shed for us will not break that relationship. Your love is unending. Your love is, is all-encompassing. It is. We are just unworthy. We are unworthy of it, but because of you, you make us worthy. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And Lord, we hold up um, we have so many people in our church right now that are sick for various reasons between having, you know, medical procedures to be done to dealing with very tough diseases and, and, and just all the other things in between. And Lord, we, we pray that you would bless all of those folks. Bless the caregivers, bless the 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 families that are dealing with that with them as well. And Lord, we just thank you for this, this church here, our body here, our family here. Let our love for each other not be limited to this building. Let the community see the love that we have and let them see the love you have given us, that they would want and desire to, to be part of it, but mainly to be part of your global church. Believers in you, a saving faith that only comes through you. Lord, we thank you. We ask for your blessing over our, the rest of our service today. We ask for a blessing over the words that Kyle will bring us from Ecclesiastes. You are so amazing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the New Testament it says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are.
so good to see everybody this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we've had quite the week here. Uh, the high school, the Sydney High School Youth Group did the See You at the Pole this last Wednesday, and that was that was good, student led, and so that was awesome. And and uh, then we had the fall. Family festival at the, out at the cruise farm last night. <laughs> that was that was such a great time. Lots, lots of people were there. Um, we just had a great time. Thank you, Cruises and Sanders for kind of leading the leading the charge there. So, um, well, let's let's dive in here. Last one on Ecclesiastes, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, but here's a question for us. How does one live in the world, right? So, so the first five books of, of the Bible, uh, known as the, the Pentateuch or the law, God gives Israel a lot of rules uh, to live by. There's, there's ten big ones, right? We all know those, but, but lots and lots of little ones. Oh, close, over 600 little laws, uh, ranging from... You know, how to handle food to um, what happens if your neighbor's bull gorges you, kind of the steps to take there, Uh, how how to make, uh, how do you make yourself ceremonially clean before God, right? Like questions like that, and the the law is really good for that. But what about the the big questions, uh, the existential questions of life, right? Is there a purpose? Is there a meaning to all of this, right? The, if, you're, if you're looking to the law for that, you're not going to get an answer. That's why, that's why we kind of started uh, looking at pro- the wisdom books, the book of Proverbs, right? And, and again, it's an ama- the book of Proverbs is an amazing book about how life generally goes, okay? Um, if you are kind and you treat others as you would want to be treated, or treated right, the, the golden rule, life in general will go well for you, okay? Um, but then there's this book that we have in our Bibles called Ecclesiastes, which we have been in for several months now, and we, we've seen this, an old jaded king who appears to be Solomon, and if I had to boil w- what we've talked about, right, uh, down into one sentence from chapter 1 to to where we are now. If I had to boil what what Solomon's getting at, it would be this. Life is really hard, and then you die. Uh, That's pretty much what what I'm getting from, from Solomon. Uh, but and because he both starts his book and he ends his book with this phrase, and we've looked at it a lot now, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Again, that, that's that Hebrew word for vanity is hevel. It's just, in NIV, it's translate, translated meaninglessness. Um, and it, it's the, uh, he uses it 39 times in the book. It's, it's, it's his multi-purpose metaphor for, for, to express the futility of living in a fallen, broken world. Taken literally, the term means vapor or, or breath or smoke. Uh, picture a, a warm lake on a, on a cold day and the, the, the steam that rises from it. He essentially says that that is life, that it is fleeting. We are here today, and we're gone tomorrow. And, and the teacher, he, he looks all around at, at life under the sun, and he, he's been naming things that are vanity. Work, he says, is vanity. There is nothing for us to gain from all the, the toil from which we toil under the sun. Uh, merely human wisdom is vanity, because whether we are wise or foolish, we're all going to die in the end. Uh, we also know that uh, he, he talks about living for, for just pleasure, 
just living for the weekend. It, you could choose to do that, but Monday always comes. Um, it, it's all vanity. Power is vanity. Money is, is vanity. It, it neither can, can satisfy. Nothing can satisfy under the sun. And then there is death. That is another vanity. Dust we are, and to dust we will return. I've said this before. Uh, Ecclesiastes is like that friend that you all want to have around in doses. They're, they're going to tell you the truth. They, don't, they won't hold any punches. They won't pull any punches. They won't beat around the bush. They will tell you the truth. As at least from from their perspective, which Solomon's perspective is pretty much concentrated under the sun. Okay, he uses that phrase a lot too. So Ecclesiastes mainly teaches us to see how meaningless meaningless life is without God, um, and how little joy there is under the sun if we try to take our Creator out of His universe. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Everything is vanity. Uh, that's how our teacher Solomon ends his book. But thank goodness that is not the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, listening to the teacher is, is hard, and I'm, I'm glad that you guys kind of stuck it out with me here. Um, and it, because it can, it can bring us to some pretty dark places. Um, that's why at the end of the book, this, the anonymous author comes back in. He, he, he comes back up, this unknown author. He wanted us to hear everything that, that the teacher wanted, was saying, okay? The author does not want us to lose hope. Uh, the author wanted to, to humble us a little bit, and I think we are more humble uh, for it. The author wanted to challenge our, our hopes, our false hopes, and, and show us that most of our life, most of our life is outside of our control. We, we do not have as much control as you think you have. Um, and, and so he wanted us to listen to Solomon. It's the equivalent, I, I, I thought about this a lot, it's the equivalent of a, a parent, let's say a, of, of a senior in high school, a parent that maybe has this family friend who is a philosophy teacher at the, at the college, at the local college in town, and, and a parent really wants to get his son or daughter uh, to go on a, a two-week-long camping trip w with this philosopher, in, uh, philosopher teacher in this local college and, and alone for two weeks just to, to oh, and, and maybe your, your kid is homeschooled all his life, right? Like just they, they, you need, they need to experience and see things and hear things that they wouldn't have b been able to experience or, or hear. And so they need to have their eyes opened a bit um, uh, and wrestle with things that they haven't had to wrestle with. And so it, that's why this epilogue is so important. Uh, it gets the last word. And, you know, it doesn't end with vanity of vanities, all is vanity. We, we've got this. And so um, let's, let's hear it together. Um, I, I'm going to read this, and, and we did this last time. If you are able, if you can, at the reading of God's word, could we stand together? And, and let's, let's hear God's word read aloud. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 12, 9. But besides being wise, the teacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs. The teacher sought to find pleasing words, and he wrote words of truth plainly. The sayings of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings that are given by one shepherd. Of anything beyond these, my child, beware. Of making many books, there is no end. 
and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of all matter has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of everyone. For God will bring about every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. These are the very words of God. You may be seated. So let's unpack this now. So the, the, the jaded king truly was wise. He pondered and weighed all the ev evidence available to him. He studied many proverbs, and he tried to find just the right words to convey what he wanted to get across, right? Words like, who could straighten what God has made crooked? And uh, one handful of rest is better than two fistfuls of toil. Ecclesiastes also does have poetry in it, beautiful phrases that we've looked at. To everything there is a season. Uh, God has set eternity in the hearts of man. And last week we looked at a poem about death, and many of you came up to me and just were like, Kyle, that hit too close to home. Uh, you know, I didn't like that too much. Well, and I said, take it up with Solomon, right? That's, that's not me. Um, and so... Verse 11, though, the author reminds us readers why he let us talk to the teacher in the first place. Verse 11, the sayings of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings that are given by one shepherd. So a goad, uh, you might be asking, like, what, what is that? Um, it, it was essentially a really sharp stick that um, would spur on, you know, shepherds would, would spur on stubborn beasts to, to move. You know, think of a cattle prod or, or, or something like that. Um, you know, and, and Ecclesiastes does the, 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 the entire book, does the same thing for followers of Jesus. Uh, you know, we need this book in our Bibles. Uh, if, if, if we didn't have this book, just imagine, I mean, we'd have Proverbs, right? And then we'd have Job. And that, that's, a, that's a, a big jump to take, right? It, this is the middle ground. This, is, this gets us wrestling and thinking about why is the world the way it is? How do I live in this world with all the hevel, with all the vanity, with all the confusion? And, and so, again... You might not like Ecclesiastes, but you need Ecclesiastes, if that makes sense, uh, you know. Um, and so, and, and if you don't need it now, you're going to need it. There's going to be a time when you need to hear these words. And so, he goes on, though, and he talks about nails that, that are firmly fixed, right? Um, like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings of that are given by one shepherd. And again, this image is of permanence. Um, once a wise saying is driven into the mind, it stays there. Uh, just like a nail driven into wood stays there, right? Um, biblical Proverbs has a way of nailing it, nailing us right in our conscience. Um, they have a way of sticking in, in our brains. I, I, I shared this last week. As, as a young person, I, I carried with me and, and memorized Proverbs 5.21 as a teenager. A man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths, right? And, and I said it was, it was comforting, right? It's, it's, it's this proverb that is comforting. God's with me. And it's also, it's a warning. Like, he sees everything. I, I cannot hide. Even when I think I'm hiding, I can't. He sees it all. He knows it all. So, um, but, but the, the point is that, that once we hear a proverb, we're not going to forget it. Um, that there are many that we've looked at so far in, in the book. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Um, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. 
but time and chance happen to them all. That's, that's Ecclesiastes. All of these words, uh, the wise sayings that get nailed into our hearts and the goads that will make us look at wisdom are given by one shepherd. Some commentators think that that's, that's Solomon, but, but you know, some, some think, you know, one shepherd, that, that, that's God. God, gives, God the Father gives us the, these sayings, these proverbs. And, and it's not crazy. In Psalm 23, David sees God as a shepherd. That's why, and maybe in some of your translations, it's a capital S, right, uh, for, for shepherd. So, okay, uh, v- verse 12 of anything beyond these, right? My child, beware. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. I remember in Bible school, I would quote this to my teacher a lot, but it didn't, didn't really work. But, um, but the teacher knew that, that if all you did, if all you do is try to answer these big existential questions— it can lead you in a bad state. It, it really can. Because there seemingly is no end. You could just keep pulling on these strings and, and, and there's so much to consider. Uh, or perhaps you, you need to deconstruct your faith. And that, there is a point to, for that. There is a time for that. I remember in youth ministry, I would tell the kids, you have to make your faith your own. You have to. You know, you, 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 you can take a lot from your parents, but sooner or later, you have to land somewhere. You have to decide for yourself, am I going to follow Jesus or not? Is this just, just a giant crutch that people believe in, or is there something real about this faith? Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. C.S. Lewis uh, wrote a, a great book. Um, uh, it's called The Great Divorce. And in it, I'm just going to read an, an excerpt. Um, in The Great D- Divorce, C.S. Lewis describes a man from the suburbs of hell um, who has spent his whole life seeking the truth, right? Just seek. I just want to know. I want to know everything. Or so he says. Uh, the man wanders near the borders of heaven, where by the gracious invitation of God, he is invited to enter. But the Spirit warns him, I, I can promise you uh, no atmosphere of inquiry, for I will bring you to the land not of questions, but of answers, and you shall see the face of God. The man is not quite ready to let go of his quest, however. He wants to study some more before he accepts anyone else's conclusions. So he says, we must all interpret those beautiful words in our own way. For me, there is no such thing as a final answer. The free wind of inquiry must always continue to blow through the mind, must it not? Listen, God's Spirit says to the man, once you were a child, once you knew what inquiry was for, there was a time when you asked questions because you actually wanted answers. And we're glad when you found them. Become that child again, even now. Sadly, the man refuses. When I became a man, he says, I put away childish things. The conversation suddenly ends when he remembers that he has an an appointment, makes his apologies, and hurries off to to join a discussion group in hell. Are you... Seeking spiritual truth, that's a, it's a worthy quest, and you need to. Like, you, you need to do that. You need to ask questions. But, you know, it's called faith for a reason. You, you are not going to plumb the depths. You are not going to have all the answers and then accept Christ. There, there has to be a, a, a moment where yeah, you, you have to trust in the unknown. Now, it's not a blind faith. It is not a blind faith. But, but you, again, it, it's, it's called faith because you, you're not going to know it all. You can't know it all. And it looks, it looks good, though, outwardly. I, I want to study. I want to study all the religions and go for it. You can do that. But you've got to land somewhere. 
Uh, otherwise, you're going to be like the person Paul warned Timothy about in, in 2 Timothy 3, 7. Always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Who are you? Where are you here? You can, you can, you're free to come and, and hear and, and learn and grow and all that stuff, but, but will you ever commit to the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, verse 13. Here we go, and, and, and Bill said it earlier. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of, of everyone. So the book of Proverbs instructs us to fee, that the fear of the Lord is the very beginning of wisdom, right? And, and even Ecclesiastes, sprinkled in the book, Ecclesiastes, Solomon says it too. Fear the Lord, fear the Lord. And here at the end, the, the author comes in and says, you know, th this, is, uh, <laughs> this is what he has to say, right? Th that th the fear of the Lord is, is what we all must do. In light of everything, that the teacher has said, fear the Lord and keep his commandments. And note, it's, it's not the other way around. Keep his commandments and then fear him, right? Like, we, we don't do the things because we're afraid of him. It's, it's not about that at, at, at all. Um, and I got, that, I got that question a lot. And I think I'm going to get this question. Uh, I got that question as a youth pastor a lot. What does it mean to, to fear the Lord? I mean, should I be afraid of him? Um, wh what type of fear is this? Should we truly be afraid of God? Or is it more of a, a reverence, respect kind of fear? And again, all throughout Scripture, the, the, it's a repeated theme, the fear of the Lord. Uh, it's used a lot. And in the wisdom books, it's talking a lot about that, that respect, reverence, awe aspect, giving God the respect he deserves. But I want to note, I'm going to go on a little bunny trail here. When, when the disciples ask the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, teach us how to pray. We want to, we, we want to pray like you pray. Jesus right away gave him a, a crash course in, in the fear of the Lord, what that means. Let's look at the Lord's Prayer for just a second. He says, our Father. Now, he could have used any term, any, any, uh, uh, image to, to convey what it was. And the disciples in, in the Old Testament, there's lots of images of, of God. And we, we've talked about this before, but he could have been known as the warrior. He could have gone with warrior, rock, fortress, strong tower, shepherd, friend. He, he could have used any of those images, but he, he, he's wanted, oh no, the, the best connection that, that people would know is Father. Now, regardless, if you had a, a great dad or, or not, you can think of a, 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 good, a, a good dad, right? What, what, what characteristics, what qualities did, did they have? Well, protector, loving, kind. Strong, faithful, dependable, humble. Uh, father, think of Father in all the good that that entails, okay? Our Father, which art in heaven. This, this God. That, that, and we, we, we get Father, right? We can connect to that. But then Jesus like blows us apart and says, okay, this God it, who is transcendent above all, he is holy other. He is not like you and I. He is a being completely different, set apart, holy, perfect, pure in every way. 
our Father in heaven. If you can, and I'm going to stop there, right? There's a whole lot else that the Lord's Prayer is, but just right there. If you can hold those two in union, not one or the other, but simultaneously, we're, we're getting close to the fear of the Lord. Okay? Um, and it, when, you're, when you can do that, and you can do that, right? When you, when you can do that, you're, you're following in the footsteps of, of Isaiah, who, who, who went to the temple and saw the Lord. And, and he, his first words after he saw God the Father, he said, woe is me. I am lost, for, for I, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Or, or, or Peter, <laughs> right, when, when he's in the boat and he doesn't know the Lord Jesus yet, and Jesus says, hey, hey, cast your net over on this side of the boat. And he'd been there all night fishing, didn't catch a thing, but he, he did it because Jesus told him to do it. And then he gets this huge mound of fish. It was, you know, the, the boat was sinking, and Jesus was in the boat. And, and Peter, his first words were, get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. That's where we're getting, right? When you, when you place God in his rightful place, right, when you see him as you should see him, as our Father, which art in heaven, right, there's going to be some reverence. There's going to be some respect that he rightly deserves. And, and you're going to, the, the knee-jerk reaction for humans being, as we've seen with Isaiah and Peter, is to run away, hide. That's what Adam and Eve did. But the wise, the wise run to him. Because we know that this God loves us. That this God is our, is our Father. That's what Jesus wanted to, to get across. He is our Father. He loves us. And we can trust Him. We can trust Him. And so, and, and here's another example. And maybe this, I don't know, this isn't the best. But this is a little helpful for me too. Because if you're still wrestling with what's that feeling of fear of the Lord, here's a human perspective. Let's imagine uh, you're, you're, it's a Saturday, and you're watching the game, and you're with your family, and there's, to there's toys everywhere. Your house is a mess. And, and there's a door, the doorbell rings, and it takes you a while to get to the door, but you finally do. You open it up. It's standing there. Is the president president of the United States of America? You're right there, right at your doorstep, right? And and, and you 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 do a double take and and you see the secret secret service all around in your yard and and regardless if you like him or not, he wants to come into your home, right? And and whatever that feeling you have of the most powerful person in our nation, wants to come into your home, and, and your home is a mess, and, it's, it's, it, it, you, and you, that feeling right there, that's, that's the fear. That's the, this, this, I'm not quite right, and yet they want to come in, and, and I don't have time to clean it all up. That's what we're getting at. And so, fear the Lord and keep his commandments. Now, let's talk about that little piece, right? The keeping his commandments. We're at that stage of, with our kids where I just want them to do what I say, okay? When I say it, yeah, I want them to do what I say when I say it. And, and, and I really am training them to do that. They don't have to ask why. I don't have to tell them why. I just want them to, to do it, 
right? And we, <laughs> amen. <laughs> and, but, but, and I know it's, it's hard. It, it's hard for them because their job, by the way, parents, their job is for them, their job as a little person is to ask questions. I get that. But I want them to, to train them to just come here now. Uh, you know, put your shoes on. Okay, so and and okay, <laughs> you're getting that right. Um, but again, it doesn't have to. And this is, I, it doesn't have to make sense to them first. Why are we getting our shoes on? You don't need to know. You just get your shoes on. Okay, but but again, it. it so much of our lives, right? Like we want to know why too. We, and, and when we read a commandment in, in the scriptures, what happens is, and this is what happens when I read it too, I want to know why. And, and, and I want to, uh, I'm going to give you sev several examples of how this is hard for us to do, but we need to do it, right? God said, do not eat from this one tree in the garden. You can have whatever else you want, but don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what do we do? Eve looks at that and says, but it looks good. Yeah, it, it, it's desirable for food. It looks good and it can make me wise. Do not engage in sexual immorality. But how will I know if I really love the person? I've, I've got I've to move in together. It only makes sense. Everybody else is doing it. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. But I, I, I can't stop. I've got way too much work to do. No, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm too busy. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Oh, here's one. Here's one. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. No. No. I, I don't, I, I don't want to look like a doormat. Fight back harder. That, that's the way to do it. Fight back. Don't forgive. See, not, no commandment makes sense to us. They, they don't. The, the, our our knee-jerk reaction, what makes sense to our nature is not any of those. And there's way more, by the way, if you read the New Testament. Way more. Fear God and keep his commandments. Just because. We don't have to know why. This is the better way to live. So, fearing God is getting your mind wrapped around that this God who made the universe wants to have a relationship with you. And he has shown us through his word that he can be trusted. His way is right. Um, and even though there's all this hevel and confusion all around, all this stuff that doesn't make sense, we can trust him. And we need to trust him. And that, because that is the whole duty of man. That is what we are supposed to do. Fear God Keep his commandments. We do not need to be afraid of this God because of what Jesus Christ did. Legally, Jesus imputed his righteousness to you, to those who have trusted in him. Legally, God the Father, God the Judge, and we're going to get to that, dismisses our case because of what Jesus did. Our case is dismissed. Jesus already paid the fine. That, that is the gospel, right? Verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. As I stated last week, it is clear both the, the author, right, of Ecclesiastes and the teacher, they, they actually agree on one thing. And that is, there is judgment. There is a judgment at the end. Whether you have been washed by the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, or you're trying to avoid the judgment, 
It's coming. One day, God will expose everything. Lay it bare. Every secret sin that you thought you got away with, it's, God's going to know it. And also, every act of, of secret, uh, anonymous kindness, generosity, he will bring it all into view. It, it's interesting because the, the teacher, Solomon, took God out of the equation, and it seemed like nothing really mattered. But, but the author puts God back in, and we realize everything matters. Everything. There is a life to come. One day, the dead will be raised, and everyone who has ever lived will stand before God. And on that day, it will become clear that there is eternal significance to everything. Everything matters. It will matter how you use your time. Whether we wasted it or... or I've spent it in furthering God's kingdom here on earth. Lord, let your kingdom come, that your will be done, right? Um, it will matter what you did with your money. You're the steward, right, of God's money, what you did with it, whether we spend it on ourselves or invested it in God's kingdom here on earth. It will matter what we, did, what we do with our bodies, what our eyes see, what, what our hands touch, what our mouth speaks, words of encouragement or, or, you know, words that break others down. What you say to a two-year-old will matter. How you love a little person, a little child will matter. Uh, that, um, that household task that you think no one sees will matter. The tears of compassion, the word of our testimony, a cup of cold water given in the name of Jesus Christ will matter. If this is all true, and I most assuredly believe it is, then what matters most is the personal decision that all of us have to make about Jesus Christ. If there is a judgment coming, then it is desperately important that you be justified on that day, that you stand justified. And the only way to be sure is to entrust your life to Jesus, to surrender your life to G Jesus. Come to him, cry out to him. He alone can satisfy he alone can reconcile you to God the Father. You cannot do it on your own. You cannot be good enough. It is impossible. It is for, by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. I, I want to close with this, and it's, it's, it's an odd closing, I realize, but, but in, in the book of Acts, Acts 17, Paul is preaching the gospel, the same gospel that you all just heard, right? In, in Acts 17, 32 through 34, it says this. He, he's preaching to a crowd. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council some of the people became followers of Paul and, and believed. Among them, Dionysus, a member of the Aragapius, also a woman named De Damaris, and a number of others. These, these two people that, you know, Paul records. These two, a man and a woman and, and other people. But, but I want, what I want to get to is basically some sneered, some said, we want to hear more about this. And then some believed. Where are you today? Do you just want to keep gaining knowledge? And that's worthy. I'm not knocking that. Or do you want to, or you could sneer, I guess, that, you know, that this is just rubbish. 
this is just a crutch. Or, or this is true, and you need to take a step of faith and, and trust your life to Jesus. Where are you? Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we Forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever and ever and ever. <sighs> Amen. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us and throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm.